Hello. Good morning, students. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, good morning too. Good morning. I think some are still yet to come, but we'll begin with the class because it's only 8.07 for you. That is your time. Okay, so last class uh, in the law of contracts, we learned about consideration, right? Mm. We learned about that consideration is an important element in the law of contract or for the contract to be enforceable. Then we learned about past consideration is no consideration in the English law perspective. Then we stopped at, I guess, slide 14, where we were about to discuss promissory estoppel. So today we will learn what is promissory estoppel, and then we will move forward and learn about capacity to contract, which is also an important element for enforceability of a contract in the legal perspective. Now, what is promissory estoppel? Now, if you have noted the word estoppel, you can see the word stop there, S-T-O-P, okay? So rightly, just I'm trying to break it for you to understand in simple terms because, uh, you know, the phrase may look difficult, but actually the concept is easy if you understand it. Promissory, of course, you know, there is, it is something related to a promise, okay? Now, estoppel, in that you will see the word S-T-O-P, to stop, okay? Now, having broken the concept, moving further, promissory estoppel, is a concept in contract law where the promisor is stopped. That means is stopped from retracting from his promise or in simple words, from moving back from his promise. If he promises to do something, he is not allowed in law to change his mind over that promise. Now, this principle operates on the basis of the principles of equity or to bring about equitable justice. Okay? So I'm repeating. Promissory estoppel, just for you to understand, you can understand that there's, there's a word promise in promissory, okay, in student's perspective, and estoppel, you can see, search for the word stop. There is something related to a promise which, and something about stopping the promise. So now defining promissory estoppel in the right words, Promissory estoppel is a concept that deals with estopping, yes, I'm talking about estopping the promisor or stopping, S-T-O-P-P-I-N-G, stopping the promisor from retracting or from going back on his promise. The second point is the doctrine of promissory estoppel revolves around or operates on the basis of the principles of equity in the interest of bringing about equitable justice. For example, now this example is not in your slide, just for you to, you know, to set the perspective and to help you understand the, uh, what they say, you know, to pulverize or to, you know, to powder the concept into nothingness so that you will really understand this. Um, for example, say that A, Mr. A, okay, files a case against Mr. B for recovery of money, okay? Say now B owes, um, 
50,000 dirhams or rupees or whatever currency, dollars, euros, example, okay, 50,000 bucks to Mr. A, okay, and Mr. B is not able to pay the debt on time. He is not able to, uh, you know, um, repay the amount what he has borrowed. Now, Mr. A is tired of Mr. B and he keeps on warning him. See, Mr. B, if you do not pay me, I'm going to file a case. I'm going to file a case. Mr. B says, please give me some time. Please give me some time. And finally, like A is tired of, uh, you know, Mr. A. And then he, uh, sorry, A is tired of Mr. B. And Mr. A files a case against B in the court of law of appropriate jurisdiction to recover the money. So it will be a suit for recovery of money. Now, in the court, B comes up with a plea, P-L-E-A, with a plea saying that uh, your owner, imagine the situation now, it's before a courtroom. So he says, your honor, I, I'm really like not having enough much resources. I'm not able to, you know, pay the debt that I owe. Uh, either you give me some, some more time and he gives some kind of evidence saying that example, just to, you know, extend our imagination. He says that, see, I have lost my job. My family is suffering. I have lost my properties, whatever. So he gives some evidence in the court. Now it is a justifiable debt. Now he owes A. He has to pay A. Then A's lawyer proposes to the court after discussing with A, his client. He says that, um, Your Honor, we are willing to compromise instead of 50,000. If A is able to pay 15,000 15, bucks immediately or within a period of one month. Okay, so the court says, well, this is an opportunity for B. B, would you agree? So B is all happy and he says, yes, yes, your honor, I, I really agree. And B thinks in his mind, I should do anything because it's a really good deal from five zero, 50,000, this guy has come to 15,000. I must be, I should do something and arrange the amount. Then, uh, you know, uh, he gives his uh, assent to it and, uh, they, in the court of law, like they come up with a compromise agreement or settlement agreement, rather. There is a settlement agreement or debt settlement agreement to be precise. And both the parties, like he mentions, okay, instead of 50,000, we pay 15, 1, 5,000. And this guy says, okay, I promise to pay you, uh, pro pay you back within 30 days from the date of this agreement. Now, what happens? There is a next date of hearing just for the, you know, sometimes. Uh, there is an interim hearing normally, which is just a date given uh, just to, uh, you know, sometimes the court gives some dates in between just to check like, what is ha happening between the parties. So there is an, one date which is again given and on the next date of hearing, uh, you know, uh, by the time Mr. A goes back home and uh, Mr. A's wife says, what's wrong with you? What did, how did you agree for, you know, coming down to 15,000? How can you come down to 15,000? Uh, where is five zero and where is one five? And then uh, Mrs. A, like she manages to, you know, convince Mr. A that it was a very bad deal. So Mr. A like approaches his lawyer back again. See, um, can you just try to just change this? Then uh, Ms., uh, Mr. A's lawyer says, no, it's not possible. Say, let, let him name, let us name him Mr. P. Mr. P says, no, it's not possible. There is the concept of promissory estoppel. You cannot move back on your promise. Mr. A says, no, please just try to, you know, that's how clients do. And they somehow 
they want you to do something. So then Mr. Uh, A's uh, lawyer, that is Mr. P thinks, okay, let me just give a try. And kind of, you know, makes an application before the court, like with all the best words possible. And he comes up with, with kind of, um, you know, some kind of, uh, uh, you know, some sections in law and some case laws. And he tries to present a petition before the court. And he says, like, I, I, we in the best interest of justice, uh, because, you know, it gives some kind of, you know, uh, kind of a supporting argument. And he says that, uh, see, um, Mr. A cannot accept 15,000. Is it possible for, you know, 40,000? The judge is now irritated. He's very angry. And he says, Mr. A, uh, Mr. P, that is a lawyer, you very well know the doctrine of promissory estoppel. Your application is denied because based on or because of the doctrine of promissory estoppel. Now, did you understand the concept? Just giving your scenario. So when there is a promise made, the court will come to the rescue of the person and will say that when you made a promise, you cannot retract from the promise. Now, this is a simple example for you to understand. Now, there is something more to this, something more to this. Apart from that, apart from retracting or going back on the promise, another thing that is involved in the doctrine of promissory estoppel, another ingredient or element that is tested in the code of law is the promisee, that is the person to whom the promise is made, should not be at detriment, at a detriment or at a loss if he has, um, one minute, I'll just admit this person to the classroom, okay. If the promisee has, um, you know, acted upon that promise, and then the promiser moves back from that promise and that act of moving back or retracting from the promise has caused this person, Mr. B, some loss. Are you understanding me? So in the doctrine of promissory estoppel, if you break it up, there are two elements. One is there is a promiser who makes a promise to the promisee and the promiser is not allowed to retract or move back on his promise to that the promisee has acted upon that promise and it has caused him some loss or the promise has been to the detriment of the promisee then in law, the doctrine of promissory estoppel can be evoked. Are you understanding me? Okay. Now, having just set the perspective and just given you in simple terms, now let us move through the slides and see. So a promise, now we are like, uh, we are on the slide doctrine of promissory estoppel, slide 14. Last class we completed up to slide 13. So today we are doing slide 14. Doctrine of promissory estoppel, it is a promise. Normally there is a promise and a promise is made 
with consideration. A promise made without consideration is not generally enforceable. That is what we learned during the last class when we studied the concept of consideration. Now, the doctrine of promissory estoppel is a principle in contract law that when a party promises another party something that the other party, yeah, that when a party promises another party something, that other party acts upon the promise, then the party making the promise is stopped from retracting from the promise. So estoppel is a legal principle that cautions parties to a contract from going back on the promise. So promissory estoppel buttresses the contractual principle that a promise can be enforced by law if after relying on the promise, the promisee has acted upon the promise and the promiser has retracted from the promise, causing consequential harm, injury, damage, or loss to the promisee. So that's what we were discussing at the beginning of this class, that what is a promissory estoppel? There is a promise, a person would be stopped from retracting or going back on the promise if also there is, um, you know, detriment, it is to the detriment of the promisee or there is, uh, a loss or a consequential injury or a harm caused to the promisee where the person has, you know, acted upon the premise. So the principle is rooted in the laws of equity, or I said earlier, it revolves around the principle of equity and it, it aims at equitable justice. The promiser is estopped, but I told you the meaning of estopped, is estopped and prohibited from taking the stance that he did not intend to create a legally enforceable relationship with, which further needs to be proved in the court of law. Now, normally what the promiser would do is he would come up with a defense and well, I, I was not really intending to, uh, you know, uh, bind myself to this and I did not really want to legally enforce this promise, but, even what he says has to have the backing of evidence. He has to prove it that whether or not he did not uh, really intend to legally enforce a promise. So the concept and its applicability now varies from country to country, the principle or the doctrine of promissory estoppel as usual, as like normally in all the laws. This concept it varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction and from country to country. This is an interesting case that will actually really explain to you what is this promissory estoppel and it's a landmark decision and it has to be in your answers for promissory estoppel. Walton Storrs case versus Meheri, it is actually an Australian case and the case was decided by the High Court of Australia. Now the facts in this case, Voltins negotiated with Mahir for the lease of a property owned by Mahir. Now there was a property which was owned by Mahir and there was this you know, company, Walton Stores, and they come up to Mahir and say that we want to lease your property. The parties understood Mahir would demolish an existing building and erect a new one which Waltons would occupy. Okay, let me explain to you further. Now, actually, Mahir was owning a property and on that property, there was, you know, even some buildings on that property. So Walton Stores being, you know, a company, he, he, they came forward to Mahir and said that, see, we want to lease your property. So Mahir was all excited that, well, now there is, you know, uh, you know, it's going to be a commercial transaction and I'm going to really own over this property and so, there's a company wants to lease my property. So it's all excited. So it was actually understood among the parties that uh, Mahir would, you know, demolish some of the existing old buildings which are there and he would erect a new building uh, for which, you know, Walton stores would really contract for that and they would occupy the premises. So later on, agreement was reached between both the parties. Now I remember what is an agreement, okay? 
I told you what is an agreement. So agreement was reached on both on the terms and conditions or on the rent and on the terms of lease and so on. Meanwhile, these Walton stores were contemplating on some other properties in the area. So Walton stores, uh, you know, advised their solicitors because most of the companies will have an in-house legal team. So Waltons also had solicitors or lawyers within the company. They had a legal department. So, you know, the higher management told the legal department that uh, you do one thing, just try to draft a lease agreement, okay, and just send it over to Mahir for him to just review the, uh, you know, the lease agreement. And in case he wants any amendments or changes in the lease agreement in the terms of it. So Walton solicitors, they, you know, they drafted and they sent the uh, lease agreement to Mahir and then Mahir later on, he proposed some amendments and he revised the lease agreement and he sent it back to Waltons. And the month of November, Mahir informed Waltons that demolition had commenced and it was therefore important to conclude the lease quickly. It's a lease, L-E-A-C, there's a spelling mistake there. So Mahir informed Waltons that he had already commenced with the, the, the demolition and therefore, please let us, you know, complete the lease contract as fast as possible because he has already reviewed it, he revised it and he sent it back to the solicitors of Walton. Now, the other side, what happened was that particular month, Walton's higher management they uh, you know discussed with the solicitors or the lawyers and said that just do one thing let's go slow on this lease for a moment just hold on okay just hold on so they started reserving uh, talks about the lease and um, they told the lawyers um, just put this entire deal on hold and even if Mihir gets back to you tell him that we will come back to you now we will get back to you on this. Now, this was somewhere in November. Now, in January, he Mahir commenced the building. What he did was he, you know, started constructing a new building. Now, again, he demolished and he, he said, "Okay, never mind. They are anyway going to come back. Uh, I have already sent the revised draft." So there was actually no lease contract signed as yet. It was just all on talks. It was an agreement, a verbal agreement, and the discussions were on. Though they put it on hold, they said that, okay, we will come back to you later. So the side, Mahir thought, okay, they will come back to me. So why waste time? I've already demolished the structures now. Let me start reconstructing a, a new structure and you know renovating the other portion or the part of it and so on. Now, almost 40% of the building work was completed. So imagine he demolished, he started reconstruction and it reached up to 40%. Now at this juncture, Waltons inform Mahir that they now really do not want to wish to, or they do not wish to proceed with the deal. Now, Mahir now is really annoyed or more than annoyed. And he is like infuriated and he says, no, this is not right. I believe that you are going to proceed with the deal. You promised me there was an agreement. What is an agreement? If someone can tell me, what is an agreement? Hello, what is an agreement? Yeah. Offer plus acceptance, the agreement. Sorry, offer plus acceptance. Offer, you could also call it, there is some promise and the promise is accepted, right? Good. Yeah. So offer plus acceptance is agreement. So now there was a promise and the promise is accepted. Now, based on that promise, this guy has acted and now he's very angry. He says, no, there was an agreement between us. We had verbal discussions and so long you were quiet. You were informed that, you know, I'm, I have demolished the buildings, I'm constructing the other structures, and now it's almost 40%, and now you're telling me you cannot proceed with the deal. So now Mahir brought 
an action to enforce the agreement. Listen carefully. What he did was, he filed a suit against them at this stage to enforce the agreement. Now there are, of course, discussions, offer plus acceptance is an agreement, and uh, the legal enforceability part of it is not there. Uh, the contract which is legally, uh, sorry, the agreement which is legally enforceable is a contract and so on and so forth. There was discussions. And finally, long story short, the court held that Mahir should be supported in this case, and they decreed in favor of Mahir on the basis of the principle of promissory estoppel. They said in this case, the principle of promissory estoppel operates, and Justice Dian observed that there was estoppel by representation, that is common law estoppel, specifically that Mahir had acted on assumption that the contract had been signed and Bolton Stores was therefore stopped from denying that it had signed the document. Are you understanding me? Okay. Yes, go ahead. Okay, so, good. So, Bolton Stores yes, could, not retract, could not retract or move back from their promise despite all the arguments and the court said that they cannot retract from the argument because it has caused some harm to Mahir, some financial losses, and they are moving back on the promise was to the detriment of Mahir. What you can do is you can just take the citation and Google it out, and you can just go through the entire story, like how the case proceeded. So, you know, the entire stuff you can really read if, if it is, uh, you know, if you feel like reading the entire case and if it interests you. However, in this case, Walton Storrs case was a very important principle that was really upheld. That is a doctrine of promissory estoppel that a promissory cannot retract from the promise, especially when it has been to the detriment of the promisee and the promise is acted upon the promise. And further, it has of course, be to the detriment or cause some loss or harm or injury to the promisee. So this is by and large the principle of promissory estoppel. Now, you know what is consideration? Simple terms, promise for a promise or something in return. I told you last time, consideration. I gave something and I need something back in return. So that's consideration in simple terms. Now, and promissory estoppel is a doctrine which actually does not intend to displace or to set aside the concept of consideration. It is entirely a different concept. However, now let's move on to check, keep this in mind, and now let's move on to check another case. It is Combe versus Combe, and there is this Justice Denning. Uh, let's see what he said now in this case, in the famous English contract law case. Here, there was Mr. and Mrs. Combe. They were married couple. And uh, Mr. Combe promised, Mr. Yasser M. Combe promised, Mrs. Radhika M. Combe, he married a lady called Radhika, and uh, he told her that he would pay her. Sorry. You would, uh, just mute your mic, please. Yeah, thank you. He would pay her annual maintenance. So their marriage eventually fell apart and they were divorced. Now what happens in this case? He told her he'll pay my annual maintenance. And finally, it just happened that the marriage fell apart and they were divorced. So Mr. Combe refused to pay any of the maintenance later on. He's angry and he said, no, I'm not going to pay any maintenance to the lady, whatever I promised. So seven years later, Miss Combe, brought an action against Mr. Combe to have the promise enforced. Now see this case now. This is slightly distinct from what we learned earlier. Here, there was no consideration in exchange for the promise, and so no contract was formed. So there was no enforceability part of it here. So instead, she argued promissory estoppel through her lawyer, and she had acted on the promise 
to her own detriment. So this was her argument in the court. Well, there has been no consideration really, so you cannot call it a legally enforceable contract. However, uh, th there is a principle of promissory estoppel that is operating and I have acted on the promise and it has caused me some injury. So now court here, through Justice Denning, he was the one who, you know, uh, was a prominent person in this case. And he said that in this case, promissory estoppel cannot be applied. Now, it was available only as a defense and not as a cause of action. Now, what is a cause of action? Something that initiates a case. That's a cause of action. The reason for the case, why are you going and filing the case is the cause of action. But a defense point is different from cause of action. So Justice Denny or the court said in this case, the principle of promissory estoppel is available as a defense and not as a cause of action. Justice Deming limited the application of promissory estoppel. He then contracted it and he explained the doctrine and he went further and said that with the aim that it did not dislodge or displace the doctrine of consideration. So he said that for enforceability of a contract or for any agreement to be enforced in law, it has to have the enforceability factor. An important factor for enforceability is the concept of consideration. So he said that we cannot put away the concept of consideration here. Just if I cannot just cling or you know catch hold of just the doctrine of promissory estoppel. There was a promise, I agree. Probably it has caused some harm to you. But was it the cause of action or was, is it a defense point? So he says that according to Justice Denning in Combe versus Combe, this, which is an English law, uh, English case, he said that it is available only as a defense and not as a cause of action. And I cannot really put away, displace or dislodge, put away, displace, dislodge synonyms. You cannot put away the doctrine of consideration. So his lordships held that. The promise should not itself be a cause of action, but merely the foundation of defensive equity at page 220 of his judgment. You know, so it's available at page 220, but you may not go through it. If you're interested, you can, you know, Google it out and read the entire stuff, but this is enough for you. So the promise should not itself be a cause of action, but merely the foundation of a defensive equity. Are you understanding me? So now you have seen the two situations and you also learn that the doctrine of promissory estoppel revolves around the principle of equity and how it can be applied and where it can be applied. And now again, the applicability factor, it you know differs from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, from country to country, from region to region, or even within a country, state to state, it differs. And how the you know what uh, uh, concept or which concept they want to give prominence to whether it's the concept of consideration and the claim to legal enforceability part of it or to the principle of equity and promissory estoppel now again this concept differs in each country in each place depending also on the facts and circumstances of each case so this is the doctrine of promissory estoppel. So what are the elements in the doctrine of promissory estoppel? I'm sure you should be able to know it, having already discussed it in simple terms now. So there has to be a promise, I said, clear and definite promise, you know, to really um, accentuate your answer. Clear and definite promise. There must be some kind of legal relationship. Now, reliance or acting upon the promise by the promisee. So there is a promise which is clear, which is definite, and there is uh, that is made by the promiser, and there has to be a promisee who uh, you know relies and acts upon the promise. Then such an act was in good faith, in complete reliance of the promise. And next is where the promisee again has acted, and as a result, there is some loss, harm, or injury caused to the person. So it has been to the detriment of the promisee. Next is that it has, uh, there has been an un 
unconscionable. It has been unconscionable for the promiser. That means it is something that should prick the conscience of the promiser to go back on his promise or to retract from his promise what he has given to the promisee. So therefore, parties seeking to enforce promissory estoppel must be able to establish that it has been unconscionable for the promiser to retract from his promise to the detriment of the promisee. So I hope and I believe that you've understood the concept. It may seem difficult, but it is not difficult at all. Okay, so this is all, and this also is a very important question for you. So this is the doctrine of promissory estoppel.